All right, everyone, if I can uh, encourage you to take your seats as we will, uh, especially you, Professor Chesney. All right, OK. So um, we're uh, about to commence our final panel of the day. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have the much anticipated concluding keynote address from Chairman Michael McCall. Um, but before I take my seat and introduce the panel, I uh, first wanted to, uh, to comment that a conference like this uh, doesn't come together very easily. You've heard from uh, me and Bobby Chesney and Chuck Alsop and Joe Detrani with INSA, and we're honored to be leading uh, some of the organizations that, that put this on. But really, all the work has been done by our, our staff and volunteers. Uh, just to give you some numbers, we have combined between Clemens and Strauss 10 full-time staff who've been working on this full-time for weeks. And then we've had another 40 or so student volunteers. And so. Anything that has run smoothly and uh, been well organized, they get all the credit for. Any little organizational hiccups are, are on us. Um, but please join me in an enthusiastic round of applause for all the staff and volunteers. So. And now I shift hats, shift, shift seats, and shift roles into moderator of our final panel here. Um, one mission of the Clements Center and the Strauss Center uh, jointly is helping to connect the worlds of scholarship and practitioners. And oftentimes when our centers do conferences, we try to have a, a, a mix, of, mix of both. This conference, as I'm sure you've noticed, has been much heavier on the practitioner side. Uh, and we've been honored to have some very senior level practitioners and, and, and policy leaders, and that's, that's been by design, particularly given how somebody's novel this, this topic is. But uh, we don't by any means want to neglect the scholarship side, and uh, we are honored to have uh, sitting next to me today, these five folks up here, really the dream team of scholars when it comes to the study uh, and research and scholarship on, on intelligence. Uh, each of these, um, distinguished uh, scholars next to me has written uh, some of the landmark works in the field. Several, as I look down, I realize I think I've assigned books by almost all of you in my classes and, and been benefited uh, from reading, reading them myself. But also, uh, don't let my own description uh, make it sound like this is clear dichotomy. Each of these, while distinguished scholars from some of the leading universities in the country, all have first-hand experience with the intelligence community um, as uh, full-time employees in some cases, uh, as overseers uh, from the Hill, at least a couple of you I know worked in the uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and also as, as consultants. Um, Professor Jervis, uh, going, uh, anytime there's been an intelligence failure over the last four or five decades, Professor Jervis has called in to study and explain what went wrong. He's and, 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 and he has been busy, so. Um, 
So anyway, I do, uh, so while we're going to be hearing from the scholar perspective here, I want all of you to know that these are scholars who have the ready ear of uh, the intelligence community and extensive firsthand experience of it. So uh, the details of their bios you can find in your program books. I'll just go over uh, very quickly. This is Professor Bob Jervis from, uh, from Columbia, one of the leading international relations scholars in the world uh, with a particular, one of his many subspecialties in intelligence. Next to him is uh, Joshua Rovner from, uh, formerly of the Naval War College, now from just up the road at SMU, uh, one of our sister, uh, sister Texas universities. Uh, next to him is Gary Schmidt of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, also co-author of one of the leading textbooks on, on intelligence. Um, and then next to him is uh, Jennifer Sims, um, uh, currently with the Chicago Council, uh, formerly with uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee and with Georgetown University. And then Amy Ziegart. Um, Amy, I just realized uh, with your last name starting with a Z, you are often probably have been at the end of these lines, huh? I'm always last. My okay. name is, is lower in the alphabet than Juan's, okay. and so it's appropriate that I'm the last person on the last panel of last. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Well, take advantage of it and correct everything else that's been said wrong over the last, last three days. Um, anyway, Amy uh, had a distinguished academic career at UCLA for a number of years. We tried um, frenetically and in vain to lure her here. Um, instead, she was returned back to her alma, alma mater of Stanford, where she's a political science professor, the co-director of, of CSAC, um, and a senior fellow with the Hoover Institute as well. Uh, so we are going to be hearing some initial uh, thoughts from uh, each of these scholars in sequence going down the line uh, on what they've heard over the last few days, drawn on their own scholarship on um, an intelligence form and, and where we go forward, and also addressing a few of the particular questions that have come up. So, uh, Professor Jervis. Uh, thank you, Will, and uh, you know it has been a really marvelous uh, day and a half, and uh, I think the practitioners. You said some of us who are scholars are also had a little dabbling in practitioners. And the practitioners, of course, many of them are scholars both in their, not only in what they write, but a lot of the job of intelligence is really very similar to what we do as scholars. So the gap here is much less than it is in some areas. Uh, let me try both to reflect on what has been said and, and draw on my experience as a consultant, but I want to stress that uh, my knowledge base is really quite thin. I mean, I have done several post-mortems, a couple of pre-mortems um, down in the agency, CIA, <laughs> a, a couple, yeah, they're waiting to die. I told <laughs> the boss party, I want a live one for at least once. Uh, and. You know, but uh, the degree of knowledge that certainly I have is just nothing like what their previous speakers have had. So that gives me great confidence in my conclusions. <laughs> so let me, it's good and bad, all right. Are we uh, better? Yes and no, uh, typical academic answer. I do think that we wouldn't make the same mistakes certainly on the Iraq WMD case, which is one I did a post-mortem on. Uh, I don't think we would have gotten it right, but I don't want to go into that, but we wouldn't have committed the same errors. We would have done a much better job due to the reforms put in place. And I think that's certainly true for, again, 9-11. Uh, I'm uh, not as confident in my knowledge here because I have not worked much on intelligence, on terrorism, where a lot of the discussion has been. I just want to stress that my remarks from here on in are focused on the real broader political intelligence, including WMD, but not the terrorism piece, because I just don't know enough. But my guess is, would we have thwarted the plot? Mm, good chance, but we certainly would have come a lot, a lot closer. So I think there have been uh, really some fundamental improvements. Well, on the other hand, when I look at general political intelligence, thinking of the NIEs I'm asked to review, or some of the sort of day-to-day -day intelligence, most of it's CIA, I should say. I see some from INR, uh, a little DIA, but mostly I'm really referring to CIA, because that's where I, I do more of my time. and, and um, then I compare some of those products to what you can all read, a declassified uh, NIEs and other intelligence products from the, say, 1960s. I'm not sure we're really better 
The products are quite different. They've got different strengths and weaknesses that reflect somewhat just the increases in numbers of people in greater specializations. In called the old days, good and bad, uh, the estimates part were written by people who had their job as just writing them, and they were more experienced and sometimes had less narrow expertise, and they wrote in a more opinionated way with many fewer sources, but they communicated the ideas, I think, much more clearly. They often centered on the crucial questions even if they couldn't fully answer them. I compared some of the classified uh, Afghanistan material I was reading with the Vietnam uh, you know, coming out either of the, uh, on the community level or CIA. I think the uh, Vietnam material is probably better. Really had a deeper understanding. Okay, why is that? Let me talk about what I see as, you know, problems. Some uh, really brought up by the previous panel, but but some not. Uh, one is, uh, I think we have overlearned from the WMD failure. Uh, the stress on sourcing, yes. We, one of the problems with the Iraq and other estimates was details on people not knowing sources. We can talk about it later if you want. Let me just say that as, and go on. So now the idea is you have to source everything. Well, that's fine, except um, there can be a fetish of this that gets in the way of political analysis. And I should say, sorry, I should have said this at the beginning, but. A lot of my views here come from my working with the worker bees, the lower level analysts. And the one panel you missed, you had the view from inside, outside, or should have had a view from the bottom. Would have liked to hear from five or six people who'd worked there four or five years, because they're the people I spend quite a bit of time with. And so I wouldn't claim to represent all of them, but some of what I'm saying is repeating what what they've told me and what I see in the documents. Every paragraph, I want to see if people who know more can just, you know, you're lucky if you can write a whole paragraph. You usually don't. You write two introductory sentences, four bullet points, and seven footnotes. If God had wanted us to write with bullet points, she would have given us PowerPoint. <laughs> this is not a way to, good, to do good intelligence. You cannot develop a sensible argument. Uh, you can't even think cl as clearly this way. This is partly one problem from the WMD. Uh, another problem partly related to that is so many layers of review, which I doubt improve the, uh, the, the product. You know, they're just in the same from a university, too many layers. Easier said than changed, but I think if you look at the structure, how it's changed over 10 or 15 years, we've had more layers of review, part of it due to try to integrating from various sources, but it's been overdone. Uh, if you cut out layers, will you have some costs? Will you make some errors? Yes, I think you will. There's a price to be paid. But you will, in a way, it's a trite phrase, empower analysts more. You will get sharper views coming up. And you'll be able to structure things so you get greater disagreements clarified rather than the tendency to say, can't we just work this out so we're not going to have problems from the seventh floor? No. It's mu I think if we cut some layers, sharpen differences, we would be better. Uh, another thing that the IC needs to do much more, and this partly reflects my view as an academic, but uh, the previous panel stressed it, needs to train much more. The military trains its people throughout the career. I see, at least CIA does not, it gives them a few. Core, you know, introductory courses, a couple along the way, not a lot. That's not nearly enough. They need to develop both management skills, some said, 
and managing intelligence, it really is hurting cats. It's very hard. They, you know, some people do it intuitively, but there's much more training that's needed. They need substantive training. Too many of the people at CIA who are, quote, experts, you need the air quotes, they are not experts. They do not have the depth of knowledge that they need. And uh, they need to be taken offline. No one at the top is willing to do that because it's investing in things that are only going to bear fruit, what, three, four, five, 10, 15 years later. And the cost is you take people you know, out of doing their jobs when you need them. It's extraordinarily difficult. And CIA, at least, I don't know the other agencies, just do not do it. They need to integrate their own learning from past successes and failures. They've, b both at the DNI level and the CIA level, they've tried to do more on analytic standards and integrity, and I've worked with many of these people. I've even taken some of their money, so I like them. Uh, <laughs> the problem, is, and they've got some extraordinary people, those of you who know Tom Ahern or uh, Doug Garthoff and some of the others just know they've got just superb people. It's not the way to do it. You don't want a separate group doing it. You want to take people who are line analysts and use this as a way of broadening them and then injecting what they have learned from looking at other things back into the agency. It's, it's difficult. You're going to have some problems, but, but it can be done. If you, you know, hiving it off, it's going to be a box checking exercise, which I think too many of, of the look backs are, and the institution doesn't get the benefit. Related to this, and again, my academic bias as an outsider, is they need more contacts with academics and others. It's you know, not only the academic community. The NIC does this better, still not as well as it should, much better. INR can do it. Barriers at CIA are enormous, and the seventh floor continues to be in denial on this, uh, which is part of another problem, the general bubble that a lot of intelligence lives in, especially at CIA. Large, partly it's geographically isolated, partly, of course, the importance of security, which I think they take very seriously to their great credit, but you produce tremendous bubble thinking, and it's very hard to break out of. It takes leadership that I do, even though I've worked with people, at, well, I just don't see, partly because the benefits only are going to come on stream for after a long time. Uh, related to this, the still downplaying of open sources. People have talked about mysteries versus secrets. In the uh, counterterrorism, it's mostly secrets. But I'm talking about political, broad political questions. What is Putin up to? Okay, there are some secrets there, you know, and I would hope that we're stealing enough to give us some insights, but an awful lot is not secret. Trying to figure Putin out, trying to understand how the Russian system works, you know, there's a little stuff comparative advantage internally, but not a hell of a lot. Or take another, what is e Ebola doing to the stability of the West African countries? I can't think of a single, well, yeah, I can think of one type of secret. When are the militaries going to overthrow the government? You may have expertise on that. But the rest of it, no, you, you know, the I C has no comparative advantage. Face it, the stuff is open source. And I know there's a lot of talk of integrating open sources. Is Gina still here and her work in the past? I, I don't believe it. From what I've seen, I do not see that uh, being done. Because the whole advantage of the agency is secrets. So the point is to treat that as sort of the integration of that. But it's very difficult. And I'm almost out of time, so let's just see if there's um, I do think that the uh, integration across the agencies is extremely important in terms of building a real uh, intelligence community in that getting the people from the different agencies 
to talk more, especially when they disagree. In the, a lot of the stuff I've seen, I don't really see that happening. It may happen with the NIEs that have to bring people together, but uh, I've looked at a lot of other products, mostly CIA, but occasionally other agencies, and sometimes I've been able to look at what different agencies are writing on the same topic. Granted, this is often in crises, so there's time pressure. And I don't see disagreements brought to a head in a sensible way. And then, and I'll make this my final point, I think on this often, we being the government, structure the disagreements very badly. And I think this is almost it. What is the IC contribution? Part of it is structuring disagreements, going to the policymakers who are saying, look, these are hard things. We're not sure what Putin is going to do, but we really have worked this so we can at least give you an analytical pictures of where Putin might go under various conditions and why we disagree and what are the criteria, what are the questions you should think about in your own choice of making a policy based on one or another judgment. But what we do even when we structure that is usually, and I'm, I'm going to state it dogmatically, and I, so if you disagree, those no more can correct me. You see a DIA position, or sometimes an Air Force position even within that, and a CIA position, and an INR position. The INR is always predictable. They're going to disagree, uh, of course, because that's their job. But uh, that the questions don't break out that way. There isn't any reason there should be a CIA position on what Putin is going to do. There's no, you know, it's not like there's a, a sort of a State Department versus DOD on some issues where you could see reasons why there should be corporate disagreements. There are difficult intellectual questions and we should somehow be able to structure so that you in effect have teams. There's a group of people across agencies who through their looking at the material, their knowledge of Russia have arrived at a certain view and others who have a very different view but they're not CIA versus DIA versus INR. But that's extraordinarily difficult to do. And uh, despite my carping at my friends and former students, <laughs> categories that overlap, although not completely, uh, we've made very little progress in that. So I think it'll be an interesting next 10 years. Joshua Roker. Well, thank, thank you very much, Will. Thank you, Bobby. Thanks to the Clement Center and the Strauss Center for organizing this fabulous conference. I mean, it really was looking at the lineup when I got the email invitation was a little bit like shocking. Wow, <laughs> they're all coming to the same place at the same time, and me too. Fantastic. <laughs> um, we'll see if that was a good decision or not. The, the, the comments over the last two days have been really, really fabulous, and there's just there's so much grist for, for, for the mill, and, and what Will asked me to do is provide some comments based on what you've heard for the last 36 hours. And that's really tough to do because there's been so many ideas and, and so many uh, issues to go over that I couldn't possibly achieve that goal. So what I thought I would do is just concentrate on three big issues, three themes that came, came up again and again and, and give you maybe my, my two cents on, on those issues. The first one is um, when you're talking about evaluating intelligence reform and inte evaluating intelligence in general, you have to ask what does success look like? Well, what do we mean by a successful reform? How would we know that when we see that? How do we know if, if, if this whole process is, is working? Um, most of the answers to that question uh, have to do with the process of intelligence. And you've heard a lot of discussion about whether or not process is working better so people are talking to each other more and the information is flowing efficiently and being shared efficiently and so forth and so on. Now, these, these things might be good, but to me, that's not really a victory. That's not success. Right? What ultimately matters is performance. Right? Are we delivering uh, accurate, useful, timely intelligence? And is it having some influence on, on, on sound policy judgments? Right? Um, I, I think too much of the time in these conversations, people in the intelligence community and in the intelligence scholarly community, we're, we're, we're guilty of a little bit of navel gazing. That we, we think of reform in terms of how intelligence does business rather than what it actually uh, produces. 
as I said, this is, this is a problem within the intelligence community. It's certainly a problem in scholarship, right? And the academy has sort of fallen down on this. We have spilled so much ink on intelligence failure right, over the last several decades, including, and I'm as guilty as anyone of this, that we've missed the other side of the equation. Right? If we're supposed to give good recommendations on how to improve intelligence, maybe we ought to look at success too. Maybe there needs to be a book about intelligence success stories, not just another book about intelligence failure. Second Although, issue. Although uh, Director Clapper reminded us there's only policy successes and intelligence <laughs> failures. So. This is another part. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is another part of it. Yeah. Um, second big issue is, that's come up again and again is, is personnel. Right? For, for, it, you, you can reorganize the intelligence community uh, in a million different ways, and ultimately it doesn't matter if you're not recruiting good people and keeping good people. Right? Personnel is everything. If you have really, really smart, savvy, entrepreneurial analysts working together, trying to, to do the right thing, all things being equal, you're going to get a better result. Right? Even if you have a, a slightly dysfunctional organizational structure. I would take a bad org structure with yeah. good people over a brilliant org structure with mediocre people any day of the week. Right? And there's actually been lots of optimism. I, I, was, I was sort of gratified to hear that over the last couple of days, that, that, that recruiting seems to be going well. Lots and lots of people are applying. Too many people for too few billets, and they've got these, these remarkable skills. And that's wonderful. Um, but maybe I'm a little more skeptical of this, because I see some, some, some real dangers on, on keeping these people, right? Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So if the world is as complex as, as we've heard over the last two days, this has been a recurring theme. The world is increasingly complex and difficult, and these issues are unbelievably hard to wrap your head around. Then you need good people not only to join, but they've got to stay for years and even decades. They have to, otherwise they cannot develop that special expertise, that unique uh, competence to, to, to deliver quality analysis that, that, that policymakers could otherwise get from pundits or get from their friends or get from wherever. Right? You need deep, deep expertise. That is people staying for the long run. It's also I important to build trust. Right? We, we hear over and over again, policymakers need to trust intelligence people. So much depends on long-standing relationships. Well, you can't have long-standing relationships if you don't have long-term employees. Right? So this is essential to reform, figuring out the retention problem. The problem is that uh, the private sector is a huge temptation for these people. It has to be. Right? Um, the, 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 the smart, talented, naturally entrepreneurial analysts have options. They've got so many more options now than they did even 10 or 20 years ago. Not only from academia and the think tank world, uh, but, but from firms, then there's this whole new industry in private sector intelligence, which is aggressively trying to lure analysts out, right, and give them a lot more money. And if they can keep their clearances, well, all the better. Right? So convincing those people to stay in government service and, and, and expect that you're going to live under constant scrutiny and public criticism, even when you do a good job, is not a, an easy task. Meanwhile, we are, we are um, in the thrall of integration and jointness, quite clearly. I mean, everybody seems to agree that this is a good idea. I'm not so sure. Because if the situation now is that you're only going to expect to have analysts for, hey, what, four or five years, maybe it's just a ballpark figure, and you're going to sacrifice one of those years taking them out of their core competency and go sitting in another shop, uh, what's the upshot of that? Well, the danger is that you're going to end up with an, a, a young, inexperienced analytical workforce which is spread too thin. Right? And the analysis that they produce, remember this is what's really important, is going to be superficial and it's going to be wave top, which is not a good outcome. Right? So even if there are some benefits of integration and jointness, let's be aware of the risks. Finally, the third theme um, has to do with well, where, where do we go from here, and there's been a lot of, of talk about continual innovation, continue to push forward, continue to think of the next big idea, and just go, go, go. I don't know. I, I, I'm sort of small c conservative about this. I, I think that there are some cases in which maybe the best thing to do is to, to move forward by going backwards, by, by, by going back to very simple, old-fashioned ideas. Uh, regarding an, a, a analysis, um, the more analysts I talk to, the more I'm convinced that the best thing for them would be to, to go back to graduate school and just take elementary methods courses, rules of inference. How do you make inferences 
from a vast amount of information, right? I think that would be enormously useful. It's incredibly boring and old fashioned, but I think that that would be maybe a lot better than sort of clinging on to the new uh, 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 analytical method. There's tons of these things which emerge year after year, the, the, the new trick that you're gonna use to, to do analysis. Maybe the old fashioned way is best. A second area of, of moving forward by going backwards is secrecy. Right? And this was brought up, I think, very well in the last panel. Um, transparency uh, is not an unalloyed good. Transparency and openness and more public pub publicity for the intelligence community can be very bad. If there is a public expectation that intelligence products will be revealed, that intelligence is going to suffer. Right? Candor between intelligence and policymakers is going to go away. Trust is going to decline. This is just the same as in attorney-client privilege or doctor-patient confidentiality. If there is a belief that secrecy is sacrosanct, you can expect better intelligence and a better relationship between intelligence and policy. But if there's always a public expectation that they also get to read the, the latest estimate, that's gonna go away. Right? And you're gonna get some very vanilla products and it's, it's, it's gonna end, end badly. A third way in which uh, secrecy might be a good thing is compartmentalization. Right? And this goes against integration, again. I see a danger in, in efforts to pool all of the information so that everybody has access to it all of the time. There's a great danger in this. The, the, the risks of major data breaches is huge. The, 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 the ability for low level intelligence analysts and contractors to steal vast amounts of information and, and, and give it away is real. We've learned that over the last two years. Some people were warning about this a decade ago. Beware the move towards information sharing. Um, it might be frustrating having stovepipes, but again, there's a benefit of having compartmentalization. And finally, maybe we should think about priorities. What do we want the intelligence community to really do? Right? Especially all of the panels yesterday, they were very focused on, on terrorism, counterterrorism, and the, that is the, the, the function of the intelligence community. Um, I don't know that the future is gonna be all terrorism all the time. I actually sort of doubt that it's gonna be all terrorists terrorism all the time, right? And that intelligence shouldn't be set up uh, first and foremost to be about finding the next terrorist and, and targeting and killing him. Right? That there's, there's bigger problems for intelligence to, to think about. Um, I think the most important challenge for intelligence in the next century is China. I think the most important challenge for the intelligence community is, is grappling with the, what might happen if China rises and if the political order in East Asia starts breaking down. This is a classic, traditional, old-fashioned, great power politics question, right? right. It, it, and, and I think that this could be much more consequential than, than the work that's being going on today. And not to downplay terrorism, but I just think that what happens in East Asia could have huge, huge consequences. But you might disagree with it. You might disagree. You might think that, that terrorism and, and, and other issues are more important, that China is basically manageable and not that big an issue. But just ask yourself, what if I'm right? right? What if we're actually heading back towards a world of great power politics and great power competition? What are the consequences for intelligence? Would the reforms that we've done over the last 10 years and the reforms that some people have proposed over the last 36 hours still make sense? I'll leave it at that. Here. Uh, well, Will, thanks. Uh, thanks to you and Bobby and Insa for the invitation to appear today. Um, clearly, you hit my sweet spot the first night with Tex-Mex uh, dinner. Uh, so, uh, although Gary is a Texas native. And, yeah. Yeah. So, but as, as, you, as you well know, since I work at the American Enterprise Institute, there's absolutely no free lunches or dinners. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I have to pay for my uh, sins uh, coming by um, uh, talking today. Um, as Will mentioned, I, I was the Democratic Staff Director on the Senate Intelligence Committee way back, um, actually very early days uh, of the committee. Um, and then I went to work in the Reagan White House and I was the Executive Director of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, uh, which means that essentially for most, most of a decade, uh, I got to tell people I worked at SISI and PIFIAB, uh, which when I talk to my relatives and they ask, you know, what do you do for a living, and you say PIFIAB, they think you have a speech impediment. <laughs> um, and so I thought, you know, when I got to AEI, well, you know, that would be solved. That's very simple. Uh, but now I'm director of something called the Maryland Ware Center for Security Studies, which my colleagues have dubbed MUCUS. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 
I'm, I'm, I just, I'm just never going to get away from bad acronyms, I think. So now, um, let, me, let me begin with a caveat. I, I haven't had clearances for uh, uh, 20 plus years. Um, so and I think it's very hard for uh, somebody who doesn't have clearances to get the fine uh, you know, grain touch to understand how some of these uh, new efforts, the reform laws, uh, have played out in practice. And so I'm not, so I'm just not privy to those things. So I'll be trying to mostly raise questions uh, from a broad perspective, uh, because again, I think it would be hubristic on my part to suggest that I that I really have an insider's account of whether or not the reform effort has been positive or not. And you have to really, um, over the last day and a half, I've had to rely on uh, the comments made by uh, the other panelists. Um, and on the whole, one would take away that things are going pretty well. Um, I thought the last panel actually balanced out that impression a little bit, which was useful that you know um, the reform effort is probably in the whole positive, but there's, there's the, it's not going as smoothly as, as some might suggest. Um, but the other thing I would suggest is, as an old political scientist, I would suggest that it's way too early to tell um, about the ramifications of the reorganization. Um, we're only now beginning to fully comprehend um, the ins and outs and the downsides and the upsides of Goldwater Nichols. Um, there's a lot of praise of Goldwater Nichols, and, and rightly so. I think it's made a huge impact. In, when it comes to actually waging war, but there are downsides, and, and those are, uh, you know, need to be understood as well as the upsides. Um, we were talking in the last panel about acquisition reform. Well, if you talk to the acquisition people in the Pentagon, one of the downsides of Goldwater Nichols is, has been acquisition. Um, it's made those things a heck of a lot more complicated. Uh, so again, I think when it comes to you know, the legislation uh, that reformed, uh, reorganized intelligence, I think uh, we have to keep in mind that in the years ahead, uh, we'll be seeing these things, um, these issues bubble up that we hadn't thought about that are both uh, better, but also worse. Um, and also, I would just say, again, again, putting on my political science hat, um, I think we have a hard time actually describing the virtues and the vices and how these things are playing out working uh, because we've, we've essentially been at war for uh, since 2001. Uh, and war has a way of pressing bureaucracies into doing uh, more advanced things, cooperating more and the like. And so one of the things we'll have to think about, if we ever get out of a uh, situation where we're not at war, one of the things we'll have to think about is how, as I think Joshua was pointing to, is how uh, these reforms are going to work uh, in, a, in a more peaceful environment. Uh, not that the national security won't matter, but, but again, being at war really does uh, have a tendency to focus the mind and focus bureaucracies. Um, now, uh, turning to the, the actual Reform uh, Act itself, um, I don't know if Mike Allen is still here, but... Um, he, he had to go to the airport. Okay. Uh, uh, Mike's book, Blinking Red, is really a remarkable book, um, and it will become a classic in the congressional studies. With, People will be assigning it as, you know, sort of, sort of here's how a law is made uh, kind of thing. Um, although Mike was telling me last night um, that he was looking forward to Brad Pitt uh, playing him <laughs> and, and the movie rights. Uh, so, but uh, uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but, you know, so, but Mike's gone, so I can, he can't argue with me. Um, uh, um, but I, I do think the book can be misread a little bit. Um, uh, because it's a very fine-grained, detailed account of all the uh, various interests and turf fights that went on in, in, in the creation of the Reform Act. And, um, and there's a tendency when people read the book, I think, to look at it and go, well, you know, this is what resulted was a kind of a compromise uh, piece of legislation that really didn't fit anybody's full desires. And as a result, you know, uh, it somehow uh, deeply flawed in, in, that re, in that respect. Um, you know, it's the classic case of, you know, uh, sausage making, you know, up close actually uh, doesn't look so hot. Uh, but as somebody who had sausage this morning for breakfast, uh, the truth is it's, it's a tasty meat. <laughs> and so uh, I would suggest that when looking at uh, Mike's book and understanding what went into the legislation, I think actually we too simplistically think of interests, intelligence uh, interests, and bureaucratic uh, turfs 
as being simply that, when in fact, usually, uh, I, had a play, I had a professor in graduate school who very rightly made us think through that, look, it may well be that th something's not satisfactory, but there's usually original reason uh, to look at or that would explain why people did what they did or why they built the institutions they did. And so there's a logic behind those turfs and there's a logic behind those interests uh, that shouldn't be dismissed so merrily. And I actually think, uh, in this case, the, the, the legislation, uh, despite the fact that it's a compromise, actually is a rational compromise. Um, because, there, because the intelligence community, um, well, jumping back again, uh, one of my uh, closest colleagues as an academic was James Q. Wilson. And he w wrote this wonderful book on bureaucracy. And uh, Wilson's central point there was that uh, the best bureaucracies are ones that are uh, uh, ones that have single tasks. Um, you can align your culture, you can align your institutions to do those things. Um, unfortunately, the intelligence community doesn't have that luxury. Uh, it has multiple tasks, it has multiple bosses, it has multiple audiences, and the result is um, it's not going to be clean and uh, clear about how it should be organized. And so just as um, it probably was the case that it was time for reorganization because the intelligence community had outgrown the capacity of the DCI to be able to manage it in any sensible way. Um, I also think it's the case that the 9-11 commissions hoped that they were going to create something that was dramatically different. Um, actually, I would say more along the lines of GM in the 1950s and 60s. Um, I think the reality is that between those two extremes, um, something was, was done that was basically right, and we'll have to see as, as, as the years move on. Um, now, uh, one of the things I thought I should do in my time is also talk about some stuff I think that actually wasn't raised in, in the conversations we've had uh, over the last day and a half. Um, uh, although uh, Josh has taken up some of this, and so has Professor Jervis. Um, I do wonder whether or not, um, because of the emphasis on counterterrorism, um, how much improvement or whether or not there's been any improvement. Um, I mean, the DNI has got an obligation under the, under the reform law to be more aggressive in competitive analysis and uh, using different kinds of techniques to produce uh, better analytic products. Um, but, for example, on China, um, if you were to ask uh, folks, and Admiral Willard, for example, the former PACON commander, uh, remarked a few years ago that uh, when it comes to analyzing the Chinese military buildup, we seem to be a day, lot, day late and a dollar short consistently. Um, so the question is, um, has, in the effort to sort of get counterterrorism right, uh, are we still paying enough attention to the, the old issues of uh, great states uh, like Russia and China? Uh, the other thing I would say is that um, we're in a period where there's kind of incoherence when it comes to the intelligence analysts analysis altogether. Uh, when you hear people talk about sort of what's been successful in the intelligence community, you hear about the uh, NCTC, uh, the fusion centers, and the like. And really, those are unique when you think about modern American intelligence, which is combining the operators and, 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 uh, and analysts in one organization. And as, as Steve Hadley was pointing out, the experiment on the NS NSC staff of bringing intelligence folks into you know, the policy circles of, of the NSC were really um, they thought worked quite well. Um, I'm somewhat, well, I'm not somewhat sympathetic. I'm really quite uh, a supporter of that. But that stands in real contrast to the creed that you always hear, and we heard it yesterday and the day before, about um, and the intelligence being telling truth to power. Um, I d actually don't think that is the function of intelligence. Um, and it's certainly not the function of uh, analysts 95% of the time. Uh, most analytic products are going to be a combination of uh, analytic ability, some facts, maybe a few secrets. But the truth is, um, I think analysts and policies make uh, work better together when they don't think of themselves as being this division between, you know, I have the objective truth and you're the sort of mm -hmm. policymaker who only, you know, does norms, right? The fact norm uh, distinction. Um, so uh, I would like to see us. Uh, bury truth to power, mm -hmm. and go back to an older notion of intelligence function, which is the G2 function. Um, can you imagine, you know, if you're on general staff and, and you thought of your job as to tell the general, 
you know, screw it, you, you're really wrong, right? That's not what you do. Your, your job is to help him make command decisions with the best information possible. It's not to sort of disagree with uh, or point out the flaws. Uh, it'd be like a football s scout going out uh, to you know, scout the, the opposing team for the next week's game and coming back to the coach and saying, by the way, you're going to lose. Um, that's not what <laughs> scouts are supposed to do. Um, uh, then very, very quickly, um, we haven't talked about human, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, Gary, can you explain that term for the? Oh, human, yeah, so human intelligence, collection of uh, human intelligence. That is uh, typically not always, but secrets from people that have access to knowledge that you want to, or information you want to have to help you make better decisions. Uh, sometimes those are, uh, you know, uh, internal discussions uh, by other governments and or the like. Um, um, one of the flaws in the 9-11 Commission report is that um, it spends an immense amount of time uh, talking about um, not you know, putting the dots uh, together, but what it doesn't talk about, I think there's only like 10 lines in the whole report that mention the fact that there weren't many dots. Um, and partially that had to, not always, not always, but partially it had to do with the fact that we had very few to no real sources inside Al-Qaeda. Um, and that's been historically a, a much of a problem throughout the modern uh, intelligence community when it comes to human. Uh, we've not had adequate sources. Uh, we didn't recruit very many sources when it came to the Soviet Union. Um, it's, uh, some of the sources that we had in Cuba, and Nicaragua, East Germany, 90% um, of them or more were double agents. Um, we haven't, didn't have very many sources when it came to Iraq, either um, in the first Gulf War when we discovered that Saddam's uh, weapons program was more advanced or we didn't have intelligence human sources of note when it came to saying he had gotten where he had stopped you know, with his programs. So human um, seems to have been falling off the, off the ledge uh, when, it, when we're talking about uh, intelligence reform. Um, I don't want to, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff I'd like to talk about, but um, I think uh, uh, Jennifer and, and Amy will pick a uh, bunch of things up. I do want to talk about transparency when we get around to it. Um, and I also would like to, at some point, also say that one of the other things that didn't get talked about, which was part of the reform effort, but again, I'll leave it for later discussion, um, is largely the FBI. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's remarkable how much of an intelligence conference uh, built on reform can, and particularly after 9-11, can talk about everything um, but the FBI. So I think we're all pretty much of like minds on this panel so far. Uh, a slightly more contrarian panel, and I think that's useful. And I'm gonna get even more contrarian. Uh, and the reason is this fundamental problem that Josh alluded to, and others have alluded to, of how you measure intelligence performance when you're only looking at yourself. In my book, intelligence is about gaining advantage over an adversary, an informational advantage that you have to protect and you know you got it when you're winning. And you've got better situational awareness than your adversary does. So it's in, inherently a comparative enterprise. You have to measure yourself against your adversary. In addition to a panel of younger uh, analysts, it would be interesting to have a panel of folks who talk about how our adversaries are organizing their intelligence services against us and how they're doing against us which is a counterintelligence panel. Um, and we might get some terrific insights that way. And one of the problems with US intelligence, in my view, is we don't think of, of counterintelligence as a collection enterprise, but it is. We learn a lot about ourselves and a lot about the adversary but by what they think they don't know in order to beat us. Complicated, you know, this is mirrors and dark halls and uh, shadows. That's the world of counterintelligence, and we don't think enough about it, and we should. So my project, ever since reading Intelligence on War by Keegan, which basically made the argument that intelligence doesn't make a difference in war or international politics, is to do a lot of research because I fundamentally disagreed with him in my gut. And I went, I've gone back to the Spanish Armada up to the present to look at when did we succeed or when did competitors succeed 
and when did they lose, and did intelligence make a difference in the decision making, tracing those decisions back, and discerning from that, what were the ingredients of success? This allows us to escape from the trap of only looking at ourselves and only looking at the last war, which, you know, analogy to, to developing strategic plans and operations based on your experience in the last war, developing your intelligence plans and operations according to your last big failure, which was 9-11 uh, and arguably WMD in Iraq. And, and I wanna make a, a few contrarian arguments now about what we think we know about intelligence based on that historical research. Um, people get bored with theory, so I'm not gonna run through what the four metrics are, unless somebody wants to ask me a question that you really wanna know the theory behind this, and then I'm glad to talk about it. But um, probably more useful would be to throw out my contrarian arguments um, and also to keep my remarks shorter. So the first contrarian argument was that prior to 9-11, U.S. intelligence wasn't that bad. In fact, it was pretty darn good. Let's just review the bidding here. Um, to begin with, at the end of the Cold War, we had the major implosion of an imperial power and we did not have war. This is uh, pretty unusual in international politics. Ottoman Empire collapses, Austria-Hungary collapses um, in the 19th century and uh, things got pretty messy pretty fast and there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, we had the end of a Cold War that was a pretty peaceful transition and I was sitting on the SSCI staff during that period and the transparency we had into what was happening with their nuclear weapons and their capabilities against us was pretty darn good and it was calming. And they in turn knew a lot about us and that we were not overreacting to them and the transition was pretty darn calming. Of course then, what did we do? We cut our intelligence community because you know the war's over, so we don't need that capability anymore. Um, but then, with a downsized intelligence community, we fought and won Desert Storm. And we forget what a smashing intelligence victory that was. We were taking national assets and applying them and achieving decision advantage on the ground through sudden innovations, smart stand-up of national intelligence support teams that were built and disassembled as required, constantly fixing things. I mean, it wasn't all perfect. Um, but Schwarzkopf, when he came back, I remember he came into the SSCI and he said, geez, you guys. There were some flaws, but pretty darn good performance. On the fly, in a very, in and this was not Central Europe. This was in the Middle East, and we had been able to shift our focus and our attention over there. Shortly after that, we had UNSCOM, a new customer, the United Nations, going in on the ground looking for WMD, and that operation needed intelligence support. We did a pretty darn good job of that as well. After that, Bosnia, um, and this was one of my um, uh, most delightful moments because I had, had gotten to know Jim Clapper and we had a problem in Sarajevo. We had an ambassador who couldn't tell what the military was doing six miles, what blue forces were doing six miles from the embassy. He was really in the dark. And Secretary of State is trying to have a conversation with his ambassador, or chief of mission actually, and they are reading off completely different pages because the Secretary of State back in Washington knew more about what was happening on the ground in Sarajevo than, than his chief of mission did. So after he gets off the phone, frustrated, he calls down to INR and says, help, I got, I got to be able to talk to my ambassador. Why has he not got what he needs on the ground? So we call, and on this I, I slightly disagree with Tom because INR really, really needed the community during the 1990s and we pulled in Jim Clapper, a bunch of folks from DOD and they told us, they helped us figure out how to set up a NIST. Talk about jointness, we were joint. We were underfunded, we were, you know, pretty naive about how to do field-based operations. INR doesn't do, by the way, field-based operations. But we suddenly were on the shtick to do it and the community responded. NSA was in our door, um, NRO sent people to help us, CIA donated a 
um, some secure equipment. And, and Jim Clapper came over and said, here's how you set up a nest. And that's what we did, and it was the Diplomatic Intelligence Support Center based in Sarajevo. And that was a pretty darn good story of responsiveness, agility, quick stand-up of a center. So my question right now is, um, are we as agile as we were back then? Do we know how to disassemble centers mm -hmm. and reassemble new ones when new threats emerge and when new operational requirements in the field demand that we uh, mobilize and go somewhere we haven't been before? And what if it's the State Department and not the military who calls? And oh, by the way, I'd like to just put in a plug for old school diplomatic reporting as a very important yes. piece of all of this. And the, they're often forgotten, but they had a skill, and they forget themselves. I mean, I should say we forget ourselves. I was part of the State Department uh, for any number of years. And the cutting back on reporting was a sorry thing, and it's sorely missed. It would be a good thing. It's been revived to some extent from its lowest point, but it really could do could do better. Um, all right, too much probably on the first contrarian point, but second contrarian point. Um, if you're going to think about how intelligence is doing, and you are going to look for a decision advantage over your adversary, you're thinking mission, um, and organization comes second. What I just described about what happened in the 1990s, we were using essentially institutions and organizations built in the Cold War and we were applying them to the post-Cold War 1990s, which was a mess, and, and we did it. So organizations can be a constraint, but they're not, an, they're not the end game. If people are dedicated to mission and know what the mission is they need to perform, they can overcome them. So um, you know, sometimes intelligence failure is not uh, let me put it another way. There are non-intelligence sources of intelligence failures. And we've talked about some. Um, decision makers are part of the intelligence process. If intelligence is the collection, analysis, and dissemination of intelligence for decision makers um, engaged in, in international competition, conflict, or war, um, then decision makers are integral to intelligence. And they're inability to, to know how intelligence works, their, our failure to train them, our failure to figure out how to identify who the decision makers are on key issues and move rapidly to provide support before those decision makers know they need the support. Um, and decision makers, standoffishness, if I can put it that way, um, there ought to be, you know, we'll build this conference out. Another panel of decision makers who have sought support, and we had a great presentation from one very senior level uh, policymaker, but there are, again, at middle ranks, people who come into office who don't know how to make the intelligence community work for them. Something similar is going on, I think, in private-public partnerships, and we could talk more about that, but they're decision makers, and this, this is, Somebody talked about privateers um, the other day and our need to be able to think of the private sector in the in, um, sense of a privateer and that kind of resonated with me because I'm into the Spanish Armada, you know, and, and Queen Elizabeth gained advantage over Philip II using Sir Francis Drake and Sir Hawkins who was an advisor to the Naval Board brought in to completely revamp the English Navy so that it could beat the Spanish, and it did so using pirate, piratical intelligence, right? Those folks, if they had not done their good pirate job, England's intelligence would have been deficient. We need to think about that. How do we deal with a sometimes collaborative and sometimes not collaborative, just like Sir Francis Drake sometimes thumbed his nose at the Queen, she had her techniques for getting back at him, and it all worked out. i just saying. OK. And the third, um, and I know I'm out of time, but the third, um, so I'll wrap together the third and fourth. I know we're going to all talk about trans, I suspect we're all going to want to talk about transparency. But I think we're deeply confused about transparency, intelligence sharing, intelligence integration, and can I even 
say all source analysis because I think sometimes you just have to go straight from sensor to shooter. Sometimes that means also sensor to decision maker. Sometimes also chief of station or DNI rep straight to consular officer who's making that visa call. Sometimes it takes too long to go back and get buried in a database or be reformulated in handy. And sometimes then, if you make it too much of a shtick about information sharing, then what you're doing is prioritizing information handoff, right? Instead of getting the decision advantage. It's my, the right choice, I have to hand this off to somebody, I have to share. That's, if, I, if I'm confused, that's where I'm gonna go first. That's my safe zone. The safe zone has gotta be decision advantage. And lastly, what I sort of started with, selective secrecy. I don't think it's either transparency or secrecy. I think it is selective secrecy. It's the ability to make something secret and then release it in a deliberative, timely way. And we are absolutely up the creek on that, on both ends. We don't have the capacity to make things secret that should be secret fast enough to keep them secret. And then we don't have the ability to declassify fast for our own purposes even. Um, this is, the, our lo lack of being in touch with this is because we are not in touch with the whole concept of offensive counterintelligence and um, deception operations. And we should be, because we've been deceived by our enemies many times. Saddam Hussein on WMD, oh by the way, deceived us along with everybody else that he was trying to deceive. Only he thought we were better than that, I think. I think he thought we probably knew that he didn't have WMD. It, certainly he was trying to convince us he didn't have WMD at the end, but we couldn't see through the deception uh, that he was engineering. And that has happened to us over and over again, and it's part of the reasons we, we're not so good at, at understanding double agent operations. So the story of how we got to where we are with the 2004 reforms, which did not do the NCIX that Clapper talked about. We do have an NCIX, but is it? doing the job it needs to do? Does it have the access it needs to have to have be a full player? I'm not so sure. And on that, I'll stand back. All right, and Amy Ziegert. Well, let me just uh, briefly join the chorus in thanking you, Will and Bobby, for putting on a tremendous conference. And I have to say, and I want to thank you for welcoming me back to University of Texas at all uh, after I uh, decided to go to Stanford a couple years ago. <laughs> it is really nice to be here. Texas knows how to put on a conference, that's for sure. Let the record show the football team is much better now at Stanford. <laughs> 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 I, I don't I know. If, I hate back. to say this, and I'll deny it in public. I don't know if that'll be true by the end of our season. <laughs> I'm acutely aware on this panel that I'm an outsider giving an academic's perspective about the intelligence community. So, I offer my reflections with a big dose of humility and a, and a deep appreciation and admiration for the policymakers and the intelligence professionals, many of whom are still here. Um, who have dedicated their lives to the mission, a mission which I think we all agree is incredibly important to our country. What I would like to do, and I, I, let me just say, I'm reminded also of the fact that we're all academics up here. As some of you may know, the joke in political science seminars where I often am is, yes, yes, we know that works in practice. The real question is, does it work in theory? <laughs> so I'm mindful of that divide as well. But what I thought would be useful is to return actually to remarks that Admiral Inman made at the very beginning of this conference, where he raised the question for us to ponder, um, is evolution of intelligence reform enough? So I've been thinking about that. We heard a lot of optimistic remarks yesterday, a, more of a dose of pessimism today. Let me suggest that there are five factors in my mind that give me pause, that evolution is enough and will be enough as we face the future. Five factors that make me a little less sanguine than what we heard yesterday. The first is what I'd call the hard wiring challenge, and Josh touched a little bit on this earlier. Shortly after 9-11, uh, I was doing interviews for my book, uh, and I'll never forget, a senior intelligence official told me his biggest worry was, as he put it, by the time we master the Al-Qaeda problem, will Al-Qaeda be the problem? 
Are we hardwiring our intelligence community in ways that make us really good at counterterrorism, but may impede that agility, that ability to adapt to new threats over the horizon? I wonder a lot about that. And in particular, I think we see an evolving organizational clarity about the counterterrorism mission. At the precise moment, we see organizational complexity and confusion about our cyber mission. And it feels a lot like it did in the 1990s, where there are a number of reports and commentators saying we need to be reorganized to deal with the emerging terrorist threat. And we're hearing that in cyber today. And we heard Admiral McConnell mention that just uh, here earlier. So that's number one. Number two, even within the counterterrorism context, we focused a lot in this conference on interagency coordination, collaboration, improvement. And it's undoubtedly better, and that's the good news story. But I think, Josh, you touched on, no, I think it was Gary, you touched on this too. There's this issue about intra-agency reform. And here in particular, I'm talking about the FBI. And I think if we look at the FBI, what we don't see is dramatic change. Now, I'm sure the FBI will disagree with this. But if you look at on 9-11, Part of the problem wasn't just that the Bureau and the agency and the rest of the community couldn't share information across agency lines. The FBI couldn't share information with itself, right, between the 56 field offices. Fast forward to 2009 and the Fort Hood terrorist attack, same problem. Two joint terrorism task forces, one in San Diego, one in Washington, each tracking Nadal Hassan, each thinking the other one was actually taking up the job when neither one was tracking his communications well with Anwar al alaki Meanwhile, headquarters, National Joint Terrorism Task Force, supposed to be able to rationalize this process, didn't even know that this was a problem at the time until after the Fort Hood shooting in 2009. So, and I also think when we think about change in the Bureau, this cultural problem is a huge one. And as long as analysts are second class citizens and not able to run a field office, the FBI will not become a domestic intelligence agency that is first rate. So that's the intra agency challenge. Factor number three is what I think about the three complexities problem. And we've talked a lot about one of the three complexities here. And that's the threat complexity, right? Threat environment, Director Clapper said, is the most complex in his intelligence career. But the second complexity is organizational complexity. If you look at the community before 9-11, there were about a dozen agencies. Now we're up to 16 or 17, depending on how you count. We went from 30 plus JTTFs, Joint Terrorism Task Forces, and the FBI before 9-11, more than 100 today. More than 200 organizations have been created or reformed since 9-11. The adage in the Cold War to focus the national security establishment was, what would Moscow think? Today, the adage is, we need a special coordinator for that. <laughs> and we saw this just yesterday with the Ebola czar. So the natural reaction after moments of crisis is understandably create a new organization or a new czar to handle new responsibilities. But there are systemic uh, uh, repercussions of those decisions. Especially if the goal is coherence and integration and agility, the more organizations you create, the more difficult those challenges become. So that's the second complexity. The third complexity is cognitive complexity. And I hate to even broach this subject with Bob Jervis sitting right down the <laughs> panel from me, since he's literally written the book about this. But we're in a world now where there's more complex information and more rules to remember for the individual operator or analyst than we've ever had before. So after a moment of crisis or failure, after you create a new organization, the next thing most people like to do is create new rules, new policies, new procedures for people to follow. It's hard to remember them all now. And so again, sort of thinking about the Fort Hood 2009 case, which is in my head since I just wrote a paper about it, um, there were lots of recommendations that came out of the examinations, multiple reviews of that event. And almost all of them called for more memoranda of understanding, more formalization of policies, more procedures layered on to individuals out in the field. Harder to remember all those different things to do your job. 
So three different complexities, all growing, I think, worse. Factor number four, I think we are entering a world where there is an erosion on the government's monopoly on intelligence collection and analysis. And I think this is a profound change in the intelligence environment. If you think about the percentage of the world online, 40% and growing rapidly, the proliferation of smartphone technology and what you can do with this device, every smartphone a collection device, right? the ability to crowdsource analysis in ways that we have never imagined before. What we have, small satellites as well, what we have increasingly is collection and analysis capabilities in the hands of individuals and organizations not tied to the state. Now that poses some great opportunities for the US intelligence community, but it also poses challenges because our adversaries can have access to these capabilities as well. Just to give you one short uh, example of this, I did a simul I run a class at Stanford, uh, an undergraduate class for 120 students, and we do a simulation every year. And last year we did a simulation about Iran's nuclear program. We got real-time satellite imagery that was good over Iran over a two-week period that we injected into the simulation for Stanford undergraduates to digest for free. Right? This is the world that we live in. Um, so the Intel workforce, we've talked a lot about how uh, important it is to have talent coming into the workforce. I don't think that's thinking broadly enough. The Intel workforce is everywhere. And we need to think about not just partnerships with private sector firms, but how do we capitalize on talent and capabilities wherever they may reside in society? Everything from the uh, crowdsourcing or societal monitoring and verification of arms control agreements to thinking about new and novel ways of collection and analysis. And fifth and finally, and we'll talk I'm sure more about this, is the trust issue post Snowden. Um, let me just put a couple of facts on the table we can chew on how we think about transparency. I did a national poll last year asking about NSA. And what I found was a majority of Americans did not believe the NSA was telling them the truth about the Section 215 telephone metadata program. And in fact, yeah. over time, that percentage of Americans who didn't believe the NSA was telling them the truth has gone up despite efforts by the agency and others to explain to the American people what it is this agency is doing. There is a big trust problem. And finally, since we're academics, we should beat up on ourselves a little bit. I think the academy has played uh, an anemic role in helping educate the American people about what it is the intelligence community does. Let me share two statistics with you. Only seven universities in the top 25, ranked by US News, offer any courses at all in intelligence today. More than twice as many offer courses on the history of rock and roll, which I always say gives me the <laughs> chance to say, undergraduates have a better chance of learning about you to the band than you to the spy plane. <laughs> if you look at top political science journals since 9-11, the top three journals in our field, 2,000 articles written since 9-11. You want to know how many were written about intelligence? Three. We are not researching and teaching enough in intelligence. I think there are systemic barriers that make it hard, and we can talk about that. But with that, I'll, I'll stop and open it up. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. Well, we'll have a few minutes for a, a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I will uh, start off with one that um, both Josh and Amy alluded to, what we might call the John McLaughlin challenge from the last panel, which is, uh, are we overdoing it on flagellating ourselves on the need for more transparency or flagellating the IC on the need for, for more transparency? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. I mean, I don't know. I mean, look, look, it, it's not a flip answer. The, 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 the problem of maintaining the balance between um, secrecy and transparency and democracy is forever. There's no solution to this, pro this problem. It's built in. It's always going to be in tension. We have to be forthright about that. And despite my, my yes answer, the default position in a democracy has to be on transparency in government. So we can hold leaders accountable, we can vote them in and out of office and so on, and I, I don't disagree with that. So for, for people like me that argue that there, are, there is too much transparency in some cases, we have to make a very clear uh, case about why that's the case, when that's the case, right? So 
Um, I think that it, the, the point that I made earlier was that in, in the case of uh, current estimates, big problems that the intelligence community is working on uh, at, at the present really do need to be classified. Right? That's a category of work that does not need to be in the public arena because once you put it in the public arena, bad things happen. The intelligence gets very badly skewed for political reasons or it becomes very sort of anodyne because intelligence community, intelligence agencies rightfully freak out. Right? They don't want to go out on a limb if they know that this is going to be uh, uh, the center of public discussion. Right? So that's a narrow case in which transparency is a bad thing. Right? It has very measurable effects on why it's bad and why it makes intelligence worse, not better. If I could just add that if the purpose of intelligence as a kind of thrown out there, and people are, are um, saying is, is gaining information advantage or better situational awareness, then when you're producing excellent product, retaining that advantage requires secrecy and in some cases compartmentation, as Josh was talking about. We too readily forget the old lessons. Um, post uh, Oliver James, you all recall the, the damage assessment after his spying. Uh, the recommendation was we ought to tighten up you know, we're getting too loose and easy with compartments, and we're letting too many people into those compartments without need to know. So it's kind of interesting that we uh, are now much more interested in, in integration and sharing, and that's a good thing. Transparency is all, has really um, been a stumbling block for me. I do teach, I have taught intelligence, um, but there's a process for those of us who have been inside the community and know secrets, that you have to go through before you can talk in class or publish. And so there is a, a control on what is let out, and that is a, supposed to be a deliberate decision-making process. And a lot has been done to allow inconsequential, more historical, it, by inconsequential I mean not revealing advantages, um, letting information out. But that ought not be referred to as transparency because it's a very, very carefully modulated decision by decision process. And we just have to get faster at it and better at it. But I'm gonna say one thing even more controversial. Open source intelligence, if it's intelligence, also has to provide an advantage. And when it does, the open source products need to be classified. <laughs> because if they are not providing an advantage, they shouldn't be intelligence. And then we should have a department that, maybe the State Department, that issues reports um, that are unclassified. If it's intelligence and it's providing an advantage, it needs to be, at least initially, until that advantage is exploited, it needs to be um, uh, classified. And this is most important in the big data world because in big data, it is the processing and exploitation which holds the key to the secrets one can derive from that big data and you want to hold on to it because you've put a lot of money into processing and exploitation. So, enough on that. Can, can I? Oh. Well, go, go ahead, Amy, then Gary. All right. And then we'll start with the crowd. So make, make, make them brief you too. <laughs> okay. Right. I think what we're, but the goal here is not transparency, it's trust. Yeah. And the question is, is transparency going to lead to more trust? And I think we need to be a little bit more specific about transparency about what? And so, in my mind, transparency involves two things. It's about understanding, having the public understand the intelligence mission and the trade-offs that go along with that mission. And the second thing is understanding that intelligence professionals are like us, that we have shared values. And I can tell mm -hmm. you, sitting in Silicon Valley, that is a profoundly new concept <laughs> in my neighborhood. And so that has to be the goal. It's not revealing every NIE. It's not declassifying every little fine-grained decision as it comes out. But it is convincing the American people, who, by the way, do not have trust in our oversight regime either, whether it's the FISA court or Congress. There's a robust oversight process in place with respect to NSA. The problem is the American people aren't buying it. So to regain that trust, it's the education function of the mission and the values before the next crisis hits. So there's a reservoir of trust that says, you don't need to be transparent with me when the crisis hits. I trust that you need to keep that secret. Uh, well, Amy made 
uh, a lot of the same points I was going to make. I mean, I do worry, and particularly in the first day, uh, the, the use of transparency to, to um, somehow have the intelligence community defend itself, um, when in fact, I, don't ever, I think that's just a slippery slope. I mean, the truth is, uh, it will never be enough. Um, there'll always be somebody saying, well, what about this after you, you know, release that? Um, so it's a very difficult process to stop. And I actually think the larger problem, and I think Admiral Inman pointed to this, was the intelligence community finds itself in this position in the absence of presidential defense of the intelligence community. Um, and so, I mean, even though I you know, was proud to serve on the, you know, the Senate Intelligence Committee and, and, uh, and have friends who served on both committees, uh, as Amy was suggesting, uh, the, neither, neither the courts nor the committees have been able to be that buffer that everybody thought they would be when we first created those institutions, which was they were going to be, you know, sort of the liaison between public opinion and public sensibilities and the executive necessities to do uh, di different things in foreign affairs. And the reality is on a day-to-day -day basis that sort of works, but when a crisis hit or a scandal hit uh, or scandals have hit, um, neither one has been able to survive um, being able to be that, that you know, articulate buffer to explain to the American public what the intelligence community has to do and does do. So I think it really comes back to presidential leadership and the, on this matter of trust and, and the absence of that, we're just gonna have a really difficult time. All right, so we've got an extremely limited time, so I'm gonna be ruthless here. Um, and Captain Archuleta gets one question, George gets one question, we're gonna take them in sequence, then the panel will, uh, will uh, answer, and then we uh, need to allow Chairman McCall to start promptly at 12.30. So. Uh, thank you for uh, this contrarian uh, uh, opinion here, this uh, collective opinion. And I find it remarkable uh, that the practitioners were more, uh, were greater advocates for transparency than the scholars, uh, so that the times they are changing. Uh, <laughs> but to Dr. Ziegert's point about, about the lack of practical, relevant research on intelligence issues, how are scholars supposed to do that when you're calling for closed systems, less transparent information, and uh, we have a tendency to overclassify, uh, use uh, non-disclosure agreements for anything and everything. How are we supposed to break through this, this, uh, this barrier uh, when you all are supposed to be the champions for transparency and you're advocating the, uh, the complete opposite? Thank you. Okay, and then George C, and I, I misspoke earlier. What I meant to say is George has the second to last question and Admiral Inman. Okay. <laughs> uh, very, wi very wise man. <laughs> uh, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. <laughs> oh, we're asking in sequence. Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, I, just for the record, I took history of rock and roll at this university and just loved every <laughs> minute of it. So before you all in this morning, we heard over and over again the vital, vital nature of human capital and how the establishment of the DNI and the restructuring of the intelligence community had allowed for very effective, more fluid collaboration, cooperation, I wouldn't say enmeshment, but more cross-pollination uh, of the intelligence community. I found that kind of hard to swallow the sustainability of that, and I'd like you all to address, if human capital is so important and it turns over so often in the government, what happens when you have Aristotle in every key intelligence post, immediately followed by Bozo the Clown, who won't <laughs> play in the same sandbox and gets incredibly tight with information? How do, you, how do you institutionalize wise collaboration between the intelligence community? Okay, okay all right. The panel can take those two questions. Yeah, yeah, I'll start with it. It's a great question about transparency. I am not advocating for a reduction in overclassification. I have, a, I have a secret wish list of all the government documents that I really would like to have declassified. There are a lot of them. Um, and I think it's really important. Academics can't do research on the intelligence community if there's no data, right? As I tell my own students, no data, no dissertation, right? That's the bottom line. So it's not an all or nothing enterprise. I think as Jennifer pointed out, there are things that are being released that should stay secret, and there are lots of things that are classified that should not be classified. Um, and we have to fight too hard to get that data. I can't tell you the number of times where I have asked for information 
that is unclassified, and I still have a government agency in the IEC telling me they won't give it to me. So this is a challenge, right? So I don't, I'm not, I don't think we're all advocating for making everything closed off. And I think it's very clear that the government should be declassified at a much faster rate in a more systematic way to encourage scholarship. But what do we need to be transparent about? I fully recognize that there are many things that our government needs to keep secret for a reason. And I think it's important that we, even as scholars, recognize the need for that balance. Professor Jervis. Yeah, I, I chair the uh, historical review panel for CIA, which um, provides not oversight but advice, much of it ignored, uh, for about declassification of historical documents, documents 25 years old and older. So, and uh, despite my nasty crack about that, actually CIA, I think, does uh, has really been quite responsive. There are a lot of documents that are 25 years old and some that are more recent that you can do research on. Uh, many of them are available on the web. Some, one, uh, some are not. Uh, they'll eventually be on the web, but they're only available on the computer system at the National Archives. But uh, for the purpose of scholarship, often these older materials is extremely interesting, and it can be melded with documents about the decisions that are taken, and now with documents on the other side. Uh, that there are a fair number of Soviet and Chinese documents that are out. So you can really do quite very good historical research based on this. Let me give it just a, uh, a pitch for a book of a, uh, a student of ours is uh, Karen Yari Milo has a very interesting book called Know Thy Enemy about how intelligence and decision makers actually go about the problem of assessment somewhat differently, looking at the British in the 30s and the US in the Cold War, specifically in the Carter years, combination of documents and latter and interviews. So yeah, I think we can do more, uh, more uh, research. Very briefly on George's really excellent question. And this is the problem. If, if you discourage too much collaboration, then you're going to be stuck with mediocre people just controlling their own tiny fiefdoms, and that's not useful to anybody. One possible, there's no perfect solution, but one way of dealing with this problem has to do with who you hire, right? And so there's a lot of decisions that go into what kind of people you want to hire into the community. My preference is to hire people who are entrepreneurial, uh, that that's built into their DNA. The, the, the solution to collaboration for me is don't design a structure in which you plunk somebody into another agency and assume that collaboration is happening. I want people in the community that pick up the phone, right? that, they're, that, they're, that their normal answer to, to how do I solve a problem is, who do I know elsewhere? Like, how, who do I need to talk to? And, and, and there's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of analysts aren't built that way because they're, they're, they tend to be more academic and more to themselves. But you have to find those people and aggressively recruit them and make them want to join up. Can I just jump in really fast on that? Okay, very quickly. Three levers of organizational change. Who you hire, how you train them, how you promote them. All three of those. I realize that we're holding up Michael McCall in the process, so I'll try to be fast. Um, Josh, when we talk about the jointness, we're not talking about analysts, we're talking about people who are moving to manager mm -hmm. level and to make sure that they're then going to look at all. The, so all of this focus isn't to move. You want the greatest depth for the analyst of expertise that you can maintain. But as you move to the managers, that's where you want the jointness feature to play. Amy, you have only made me much sadder that you didn't come and join us. <laughs> in the process. Uh, to the point that we paid very little attention to, and that's the question of human intelligence. Uh, I worry from a distance with no direct knowledge. How much has the focus on drone, drone problem, distorted focus on it, maintaining the level of competence in clandestine human collection? But Jennifer, my, you touched my hottest button here <laughs> on Human and overt human intelligence. In 81, President Reagan told me to spend whatever I needed to rebuild. CIA, 
competence, the ability to rebuild was limited by the size of the training establishment. It had been drawn down. I went to state and offered to give them a large number of billets to restore political economy, and they turned me down. They didn't want it being in the defense appropriation subcommittee budget. Fast forward 20 years after 9-11, I did an op-ed that New York Times published and then syndicated. Number one need was to rebuild overt human intelligence, start at the State Department. Colin Powell had Grant Green call me to say we couldn't possibly undertake that problem. So if you want to know why we haven't rebuilt over human intelligence. It starts on the policymaker side. Last point, it's easier to measure our success in supporting military operations. Much harder to measure the success in supporting policymakers. All I can relate to you is my experience. If I took forward intelligence that agreed with the policymakers' view, I heard how brilliant I was. <laughs> and if I took in something that didn't, I heard how terrible I was. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming. All right. All right. While I have the microphone here, um, we're going to take a nine-minute uh, comfort break. Uh, hit the bathrooms, uh, coffee if you need it. Please come back in here for a 12:30 prompt start for Chairman McCall, our closing keynote. Thanks. You guys were terrific. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I made this good. Oh, no, no, no. 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 no.